Ladies and gentlemen, we have the Chancellor's procession for the 13th Convocation Lecture of Covenant University. after the professors, I have members of Senate, the professors of Covenant University. They're coming right after the heads of departments. Ladies and gentlemen, I can see the Dean of Colleges. A attire. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin this program, I would like to invite the chaplain of Covenant University for the opening prayer. The chaplain, sir. Praise the Lord. Please let us pray. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to thank you for making this day to come to pass. And thank you because at this convocation lecture today, you will grant utterance to the speaker in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, all of the things that will be discussed here today, the suggestions, the recommendations that will be made, shall be to the advancement of our university and to the advancement of our nation, Nigeria. Father, again, we thank you. We give you praise. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have prayed. And amen. Please, while we're in standing, the Covenant University Band will lead us in the National Anthem and the Covenant University Anthem. The band, please. Covenant University Anthem.
Thank you very much. You may please be seated. The Vice Chancellor, sir. I have the privilege to establish the protocol for the 13th Convocation Lecture that we're holding today. The Chancellor and the Chairman Board of Regents of Covenant University, Dr. David O. Oyedepo, the Vice President of Education, Faith Church Worldwide, Pastor Mrs. Faith Oyedepo, the First Vice President, Living Faith Church Worldwide, Bishop David Abioye, esteemed members of the Board of Regents of Covenant University, the Vice Chancellor, of Covenant University, Professor A.A.A. Atayero, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Shalom Chinidu, the Registrar, Dr. Olumuiwa Huludaya, other Principal Officers of Covenant University, the Deans of Colleges and the School of Postgraduate Studies, members of the University Senate, the Convocation Lecturer, Dr. Tokwe Fasoroti, Executive Director, Zenith Bank PLC, members of faculty and staff of Covenant University, distinguished guests, graduating class of 2018, members of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. At this point, it, it is my honor to invite the Registrar of Covenant University to please come and do the welcome of this event. Please let's put our hands together for the Registrar of Covenant University. The Chancellor of Covenant University, Dr. David Oyedepo. I stand on the already established protocols to introduce to you members of the principal officers team right here on the high table for this 13th convocation lecture. We have Professor Humphrey Adebayo, Deputy Chaplain Covenant University. The chair of the convocation planning committee 2018, Dr. Abiola Babajide. The Dean Student Affairs, Dr. Timothy Anaki. The Director, Center for Learning Resources, Dr. Jerome Idie Benyose. The Dean, College of Science and Technology, Professor Kolawole Ajanoku. The Dean, College of Engineering, Professor Christian Bolu. The Dean, College of Business and Social Sciences, Professor Philip Alege. The Dean, College of Leadership Development Studies, Professor Amos Alao. The Dean, School of Postgraduate Studies, Professor Samuel Wara. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Shalom Chinedu. And our Vice Chancellor, Professor A. 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 Atayero. Very shortly, the convocation lecturer will be unveiled to us at the appropriate time. At this juncture, it is my privilege to have us to receive the Vice Chancellor. Receive the Vice Chancellor. The Chancellor and Chairman Board of Regents, Covenant University, Dr. David O. Oyedepo. The lecturer of the day, permit me to stand on the other protocols as established. Please, you may be seated. It is my great privilege to welcome you today to this 13th Convocation Lecture of Covenant University. Covenant University is a vision-battered, vision-driven university founded on the ethos of the departure philosophy. Our departure philosophy has played out to be totally disruptive as we get feedback from the recipients of our labor, talking about the society at large. We started with this departure philosophy in 2002 because what we were seeing on the education landscape of the Federal Republic of Nigeria was not, was not palatable. I recall in those very early days as a foundation faculty of Covenant University, the chancellor and founder of Covenant University would say repeatedly, 
if we play this game the way they play it, then we have no business in this business. That's talking about the business of higher education in Nigeria. So the founding fathers of Covenant University coined the departure philosophy. Departure from form to scale, from uh, education to life applicable education. And that is what we see playing out in Covenant University today. We take our role in education leadership very, very seriously. It was the British educationist, Sir Ken Robinson, that said, the role of leadership in education is not and should not be command and control. On the contrary, it should be climate control. He said, when you create the conducive climate, the people will live up to it, then they will do more than you expect of them. And that is exactly what we try to do in Covenant University. We try to create a conducive atmosphere for our students to be able to thrive and realize the dreams that God has put in them. And as it turns out to be 15 years, 16 years after, we are not doing a bad job. But coming to the lecture of the day, technological disruption and tertiary education, redefining learning of the future. I was just chatting with the lecturer some minutes ago. What is the future of learning? Who knows it? I dare say nobody knows it, but we are sure of one thing. It's either you are in a ecosystem that has already been disrupted, or you are in an ecosystem that is about to be disrupted. Whatever happens, disruption will take place. So what then can we do as educationists to prepare for the future? I contend that we can only do one thing and one thing alone. Teach people to learn. Not teach them per se, but teach them to learn. Because nobody can say definitively what the future holds. But we know one thing. Education of the future, the learning environment of the future, will be without walls. It will be, as you have it today, when you want to take your video, you take it video on demand. I believe that is what education of the future will be. It will be education on demand. People will get what they want, how they want it, on which platform they want it, whenever they want it, and develop the skills they need to develop to do what they need to do. I dare say, that the days of the Greece, as we know it, are fast coming to an end. And uh, the far-reaching institutions on the planet today are doing things in that wise. Talk about the macro masters of MIT, where you can come, do some courses in MIT online, and get some points, and at the end of the day, just go to MIT for one year as a Greece in MIT. Nobody asking you if you have a first degree already. So disruption is everywhere. We can only prepare the minds of the future citizens on how to learn and relearn so that they can fit perfectly into the future that is to come. It is on this note, I welcome you to this 13th lecture. I've gone through the text. It promises to be something dynamic. It will challenge some of the things you know, but I want you to keep a hope in mind Can you please put your hands together again for the Vice Chancellor of Covenant University? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our Vice Chancellor usually say that in Covenant University, we are in a very good place. This is the 13th convocation, which means that this tradition of uh, convocation lecture has been kept for 12 years, and this is the 13th year. We have had the privilege of having distinguished speakers of quality, timber and caliber, since the beginning of this tradition. To mention a few so that you can appreciate what we are doing here, in 2012, we have Dr. Akin Oparison. In 2013, we have Dr. Paul Effer. 2014, we had Professor Hiemi Otimbaju, the current Vice President of Nigeria. In 2015, we had Professor Peter Okebukola. 
In 2016, we had Professor Michael O. Faborode. In 2017, we had Professor Julius Okoji, O-O-N. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in 2018. And I for you that the speaker today is taking it to the next level. Please, let's put our hands together. <laughs> to appreciate the quality of the person we have here today, I'd like to invite none other than Professor Sheriff Folari to come and read the citation. Please, let's put our hands together. The Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, all other protocols duly observed. It is my privilege to present to you the 13th Convocation Lecturer for Covenant University. I will be asking Dr. Timitopo Fashuroti, the lecturer of today, to please rise and remain standing while I present this citation. Dr. Timitopo Fashuroti was born to the family of Pa Timothy Fashuroti of Akure Town in Akure local government area of Ondo State, Nigeria. He attended St. Benedict Notary and Private School, Abeokuta, Ogun State, and Federal Government College, Wari, Delta State, where he obtained his first school living certificate in 1977 and West African School Certificate in 1983. Dr. Fachi obtained a bachelor's degree in economics in 1988, a master's degree in economics in 1991, where he was the best graduating student and a doctor of philosophy as interbank dealer, treasurer, and handled several capital market issues, standard manager in corporate banking. He grew meritoriously, heading several branches and zones, and was subsequently promoted to general manager in 2006. He was general manager and group head of oil and gas conglomerate group, agriculture desk in the head office, and supervised several branches and zones, including APAPA, Suru Liri, Ilupeju, and Ikeja Zones between 2006 and Harvard Business School, USA. Creating and leading high performance trends, teams, the Wharton School, Pennsylvania, USA, and developing strategy for value creation, London Business School. I thought you were going to appreciate and uh, honor the guests. Dr. Timitopo Fashionotti is a Christian and is married to Mrs. Tululope Fashionotti. They are blessed with three children, and his hobbies include swimming, sports, Christian, and inspirational activities. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Timitope Fashionoti. Let's sit down. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I will stand on existing protocols. Let me first of all say that I had prepared a lecture for like, um, to speak for one and a half hours. I've just been told that I have 45 minutes. So I must start to abridge but I want to believe that most of us have um, a copy of the presentation and lecture. Okay, I'm sure you all get it. And it's online, I'm sure, at some point. So let me say that I am very delighted to be invited to deliver the 13th Convocation Lecture of Covenant University. I would like to express my profound Gratitude to Dr. David Oyedipo, the Chairman, Board of Regents, and the Chancellor, Professor A. 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 Atairo, the Vice Chancellor, the management, the faculty, and the staff, students, for inviting me as convocation lecturer at the 13th Convocation Ceremony of Covenant University, the release of the Eagles 2018. It's a genuine source of joy for me 
to be invited to this prestigious citadel of academic excellence, to join the list of distinguished men and women who have mounted this rostrum as convocation lecturer since 2006. They've already mentioned some of the names. I also have one or two names I mentioned to Professor Joy Ogu. In 2006, she was the first person that spoke at the first convocation lecturer in 2006. And of course, our amiable Professor Yemi Oshibajo, the VC, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I also want to acknowledge some of the eminent individuals who have been convocation keynote speakers, including my chairman, Jim Ovia, the founder and chairman of Zenit Bank. He was the third convocation keynote speaker in 2008. I'm not sure many of us can remember that. <laughs> well, it is not worthy that the Africa America Institute recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Covenant University to partner in several spheres of society. Covenant University has become a national pride and a clear attestation to what the fusion of vision and exemplary leadership can achieve. I want to thank Dr. David Oyedipo, the Chairman, Board of Regents, and Chancellor for his vision. And I also want to encourage the management and staff and students to continue in this culture of excellence. Introduction. So this year's convocation lecture, titled Technological Disruption and Tertiary Education, Redefining Learning for the Future, provides a momentous opportunity for me to share my thoughts on how learning can be redefined in an era of rapid technological disruption. The focus of this year's convocation lecture is a, v is a clarion call on us to redefine tertiary education in readiness for a future that will be predominantly driven by ever-evolving technological disruption. In this lecture, I will provide a conversation on the topic and share some personal perspectives and experience with us. Let me say that exactly how many of these graduating students, undergraduates now, were born in 1988? <laughs> okay. Now, um, 30 years ago, what we had was video coverage, which perhaps were made into tapes. And I doubt if copies of those tapes can be found anywhere today. And even if by any miracle, a copy of two were preserved. I'm almost certain that there will be no video player that can play those tapes. We used to call them VHS tapes in those days. So the video tapes of 30 years ago, as we know them, have gone completely extinct. That is technology. Today, as we are seated here, as I'm making this presentation, people in faraway locations across the globe can tune in real time via YouTube and Facebook live streaming and watch proceedings of this ceremony and interact with us if they so wish. As of 1988, when I graduated, YouTube, Facebook were not in existence. Humanity has moved beyond terrestrial satellite television to real time web interaction enabled by ubiquitous internet connectivity. Between 1988 and now, technological disruption have placed at our disposal enormous tools and resources 
that no one could have imagined possible a few decades earlier. In the same manner, teaching and learning have moved beyond the physical classroom space to the digital world. So much so that you're not limited to what your lecturers teach you in class. Students now have access to teaching and learning materials from the top ranking institutions across the globe, essentially placing you at par with students in the most advanced economies of the world. Let me give a very brief, brief overview of tertiary education. It has been largely structured according to the Western model of higher education, drawing a great deal from the British American tradition. The Nigerian policy on education, tertiary education seeks to contribute to national development through high level manpower training, develop and inculcate proper values for the survival of the individual and society, develop the intellectual capacity of individuals to understand and appreciate their local and external environments, to acquire both physical and intellectual skills which will enable individuals to be self-reliant and useful members of the society, promote and encourage scholarship and community service, forge and cement national unity, and promote national and international understanding. In Nigeria, extant regulations allows for both public and private tertiary education space. As a result, tertiary institutions can be established by the federal and the state government, as well as individuals and organizations. This arrangement presents a massive opportunity for knowledge generation, skills development, and problem-solving opportunities for diverse segments of the society. State governments, for instance, can set up colleges of education to address shortage of science teachers, provided the story of human progress is possible because of technology ways. The concept speaks to and challenge our instincts to solve human problems using fresh and smarter technological methods. Let me look at some sectors where we've seen very high technological innovation. Let's start with agriculture. Technological innovation is impacting crop production through the deployment of agricultural drones equipped with cameras and sensors that can monitor crops growing on the field. They help farmers to gather information on crop yield, general crop health and pest activities. The data gathered are used to determine the type of intervention required to improve crop yield. Agric drones have radically changed the way farmers inspect and monitor extensive farm areas in terms of the numbers of personnel deployed. What about medicine? Massive strides in medicine. I would just have to move faster. But let me stop about talking about banking. Banking. Technological innovation has changed the way we carry out financial services. A number of technologies have come together to make delivery of banking services possible with or without access to a physical bank branch. Using a network of web, mobile, ATMs, SMS, and email services, bank customers are now able to access almost all bank services without recourse to a brick and mortar branch. What have banks done? What banks have done is to develop robust virtual banking suits to exist alongside their physical branch locations. I can't, I'm sure many of you have not visited a physical bank branch in a while. Am I correct? Because you use your phones and your tablets and your devices to do transactions. What about commerce? Commerce. Disruption in commerce. In much the same way, 
commerce activities have evolved due to electronic commerce, which you call e-commerce. In my view, e-commerce is perhaps the most telling development to have happened within the buying and selling landscape after the introduction of money that dislodged trade by barter, e-commerce. Today, platforms on e-commerce are bringing buyers and sellers of goods and services together, breaking barriers like language, distance, all are broken on the internet. A researcher can buy books. A university can pay for video conference subscriptions. Students can pay their fees conveniently online, all thanks to e-commerce. E-commerce has revolutionized the culture of buying and selling and created a whole new and ever expanding marketplace. Now let me pause to talk about one very interesting aspect of technological innovation. And I will title it the technological innovation and the problem solving mindset. And let me, I'm saying this to the students specifically. The tertiary education that you have acquired in Covenant University as prime eagles challenge the existing orders. Be continuously curious and seek better ways of doing things. One of the greatest gifts that God has given us is the gift of creativity, which is the ability to bring to mind what is presently not in existence. Be inquisitive and seek better ways to get things done. As some will say, always think outside the box. Or even better still, think like there is no box. The major breakthrough in technological innovation today are mostly driven by young people like you. In Uganda, for example, a 24-year-old, Brian Gita, developed an award-winning device that detects telltale signs of malaria by simply shining a red beam of light on the patient's finger. It's 24. How did Brian Gita achieve the feat? He had a problem. Conventional blood tests failed to diagnose his own malaria. Rather than despair and blame whoever for his misfortune, Brian Gita's creative instinct kicked in. It became Why a new way of using the skills we have found in computer, computer science, to diagnose a disease without having to prick the patient? Today, he has invented a low-cost, reusable device for the diagnosis of malaria that is non-invasive and does not acquire, require any specialist training. At least leaves the existing market leader in a much less profitable situation. It brings new players into the market and displaces existing players that are unwilling to innovate. We can think of many examples of companies that have been disrupted. How many of us can remember Nokia? Nokia, they were disrupted. Samsung and iPhone disrupted Nokia. What about our night post? They are all moribund all over the world now. Postal services, they've been disrupted by emails and courier services who are more efficient. So what are the exact impacts of tech disruption on tertiary education. Number one, technological disruption has brought a high level of competition among tertiary institutions. Tech disruption is compelling tertiary institutions to innovate more. Why? In order to remain competitive and attract student patronage. Technological disruption here is best seen from the innovative approaches that go into making the teaching 
and the learning experience more seamless, effective, and convenient for all the concerned parties, whether they are administrators, teachers, researchers, and the learners. If I'm a vendor providing a service, a customer may choose to patronize another vendor if my services is not worth the cost. So this understanding will compel me to deploy all my tools to deliver the best level of service possible to keep me ahead of competition. So technological disruption becomes a competitive advantage. Today, however, of the National University Commission, Rashid Abubakar, during a Senate public hearing held in October 24, 2017, only about 30% of the average 1.7 million UTME candidates are able to secure admission into the Nigerian tertiary institutions. Consequently, they have no motivation to innovate. But let me say this, in the future, as the socio-economic well-being of the Nigerians improve, public universities will have no alternative but to innovate, to remain competitive and continue to attract studentship. Technological disruption and internationalization. Technological disruption and internationalization of tertiary education has become one of the major trends in the development of higher education in recent years. Tertiary institutions around the world are in the classroom. Let me talk about the non-conventional education providers. Technological disruption in the higher education space implies that Non-conventional education providers will emerge. Some MOCs are owned by established higher institutions, while others are based on collaborations between employees going to the library, locating those sections and indexes. One cannot help but wonder how we survive those days. You know, my daughter, I recall when I was trying to buy books for her, she schools, um, she's, in, she's in a tertiary institution too. So she told me that she can buy the book or buy the book online. Ah. So the textbook you want to buy, you can buy it online and it stays online and you have to read it online or you can just buy the physical book. That is technology. In those days, students journey to other institutions to assess books periodicals, especially when they're writing their final year thesis. I don't think many of you had to travel around to look for your research materials. Did you guys do that? Why? It's online. It's online. So, you guys have no reason not to excel beyond expectations. We never had this opportunity is a very good example of innovation. This solution allows users to quickly assess the item on the catalog from the comfort of their locations on campus. They can monitor the charging and discharging of items on the catalog and book items online. I understand that this solution helps the university community to do more than I've even enumerated. Research. This is one of the major reasons for the existence of tertiary institutions, research and innovation. Let me talk about tech disruption and administration. Many of the parents here and my colleagues, the lecturers, will have very intriguing stories about the experience with course registration some 40, 20, 10 years ago. Course registration in 1984, when I joined OAU, it was a nightmare. For the first three or four weeks in a new session, students lined up to sign manual cost registration forms. 
was terrible. Sometimes you go there, the lecturer is not around. You come back the next day, you know, it was, it was chaos. But today, institutions register their students online. Well, some institutions might still have challenges with course registration. But this need not be the case at a time when web applications are easy to build and can be adapted to manage enrollment process and administration of students' profiles. Today, web application can be adapted for course registration, results management, lecture, timetable scheduling or rescheduling, information dissemination, student performance tracking, all that is online. Now, these are things that were nightmares to do 30 years ago. To check your results, it's a nightmare. Sometimes your timetable has changed, it's a nightmare. But now, everything is done online. So the aggregate of these innovative efforts is what define the student experience and facilitate the learning process within an institution. But there are potential risks. What are the potential risks of tech to assess and grade students' essay type examination? Very soon. So what does this portend for lecturers and the teaching profession? Your guess is as good as mine. But the upside for humans has been this. Machines lack intuition. Machines lack imagination. And machines lack creativity, which are still indispensable. Humans, however, are not able to perform certain tasks as machines do with precision and dexterity. So while I would not want to sound as an alarmist, we should begin to think seriously how to collaborate better with machines for enhanced teaching and Paul Singer that tells the Israeli story of innovation in their book, Startup Nation. Startup Nation by Dan Sino and Paul Singer. Decision making and problem solving. So this interdependence and the need to solve battlefield problems is what makes them what they are today. And I can tell you that the graduates from these programs have become <laughs> Israel's top academician and founders of its most successful companies. Furthermore, most of Israel's startups were either founded or managed by people who have distinguished themselves along these programs. So let me say this. The modern economy that will fit, and if you want credit, or you say, say yes or no, and the machine can take you through the process of your, all your inquiries without any human interference. Customized learning solutions that will address the peculiar needs of each student. This technology is a key component of the set of innovations that will drive personalized learning in the future. So let us be prepared. In addition, I spoke about the edutechs. These are educational software solutions that will open the traditional tertiary institutions. They will offer adjacent services in a case just like banking. MIB Technology is a tech company in KwaZulu. For the future, must collaborate and work in the world. They were founded in they were they were, they were founded in 2012 by two people, Andrew Ng and Daphne Kola. They were both computer science professors at Stanford University at that time. How they transited 
from offering their courses online to building a business with 167 partners across the world is a remarkable story. Please go and read about it. In Nigeria, we're already seeing the entrance of local entrepreneurs who are taking advantage of this understanding of the local educational terrain. There's the duo of Kemi Demuri and Bumi Akin Yemiju. They founded Edutech through the venture capital firm in 2012, and they started with building portals for some universities in Nigeria. Edutech desires to help traditional universities in Africa take their on-campus degree programs online to help traditional universities implement the very best of technology with their online course on-campus on courses. Currently, they have nine programs deployed on the platform with more than 16,000 enrollments. While many universities in Nigeria are still managing their own e-learning platforms, the expectation is that there will be more cooperation between the two. Our higher institutions should have in-house teams who can study these models and adapt them to deliver innovative learning solutions for now and the future. What is the future of learning? Leveraging the power of mobile devices. I know in my heart that smartphones, mobile devices, and tablets will have a greater place for the learning process of the future. Smartphones are ubiquitous in our lives, impacting the way we communicate, access entertainment, and carry out banking activities. It has equally changed the way we receive information and access the internet. This piece of technology, the smartphones, along with less common ones like augmented reality and virtual reality devices, they have a role to play in enriching the learning experience at the tertiary education level now and in the future. What are the pushbacks? Tackling the pushbacks. As we prepare for the future, it is important that we remain focused on addressing those challenges that have kept the tertiary education sector in Nigeria greatly behind the global technological innovation curve. It is true that we have a challenge with some critical infrastructures like broadband access and power. There are also issues with organization and funding of research and development ventures. These challenges make the task of innovation daunting in Nigeria and in Africa. However, the opportunity for incremental progress is abundant. We must embrace the challenge at individual and at institutional levels. We will need the collaboration between the private sector, government, and tertiary institutions. We have the opportunity to simply adapt and leverage available technologies to enhance our capacity to provide services that have great impact on the learning process. Let me start to conclude with some personal reflections. Personal reflections. I have reflected deeply on today's events. What I could say that will help the Eagles to avoid some pitfalls in your career path. And drawing from my experience and perspective and the experience of others that I know, I want to talk about the responsible use of social media. Technological disruption have provided us with fantastic digital tools for enhanced productivity. However, if you do not exercise caution and restraint, digital tools could become a serious source of distraction from the real world that we live in. Eagles 
please take off your, you know, headphones, your mobile phones, and live in the real world. The, the world of social media is not the real world. Um, I know that he, you guys don't use mobile phones on this campus, but and it's very good. Because if you go to other campuses, I've seen students knocked down because they didn't hear a car coming because they have mobile phones in their ears. So, let me talk a little bit about social media and the impact on the younger generation. See, while the responsible use of social media may have its upsides and could be desirable to stay in touch with friends and families and engage in meaningful local and national conversation, I want to urge you, exercise utmost restraint in these social media platforms. Social media has become a source of unnecessary anxiety for people who see and follow the carefully curated pictures and stories of their friends on Instagram, on Facebook, on Snapchat, and they begin to despair because they think that their friends are living a more fabulous life than they are. It's all virtual reality. I would therefore urge you, please live in the real world. When you achieve feats and milestones as you have been primed to achieve in this great institution, you are expected to celebrate these achievements in real life, not on social media. When you have testimonies to share, share them in your churches, not on social media. As much as possible, live in the real world and not the social media world. Finding your elements, another of my thoughts, finding your elements. This concept was popularized by Sir Ken Robinson a renowned educationist and reformer. And according to him, the element is where natural aptitude meets personal passion, doing something for which you have a natural feel. The first and most important step in finding your element is an understanding of your own aptitude. What's your personal passion? When you're in your element, you will love what you do and you will essentially be having fun of your life in your process. As Confucius stated, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Bottom line, eagles, wherever you find yourself, make the most of the opportunity. Do what you love. Let me talk about the renowned biologist, Wangari Matai, the late Kenyan, Kenyan Nobel Prize laureate majored in biology. She went on in life to start the Green Belt Movement, an environmental, non-governmental institution organized and focused on the planting of trees with environmental con conservation. She made a mark in the world by being a great crusader for our environment. She was simply planting trees. She planted 51 million trees in Kenya. That was a passion. Conclusions and closing remarks. So let me pause to ask our eagles, what are your visions in life? What are your dreams in life? Can you think about it for a moment? Everyone has a dream. What is yours? Every single achievement starts with a clear vision. This great citadel we are all in today was a vision of our amiable Dr. David Oyedipo. Zenith Bank is a vision of one man. Chimovia. Apple is the vision of Steve Jobs. 
and two other friends of his. Bill Gates and Paul Allen's vision produced what? Microsoft. Uber, that we all use, was a vision of two people, Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp. What is your vision? And what are your dreams? What do you want to innovate? The importance of vision in your life cannot be overemphasized. Vision will keep you on track and focused because you know exactly where you are headed and how you plan to get there. Vision will make you persevere in the face of the vagaries of life. At age 15, I decided I wanted to be a banker. I'm not a banker. I didn't stumble into the profession. That was the vision I had for myself. That was my career vision. And I'm grateful that I took that decision early enough. After my mandatory NYSE, my peers raced straight into the labor market. But I decided to go back to school and study for a master's degree in economics. The decision to resist the allure of getting a job, earning money, settling down in life was not an easy one. It entailed numerous trade-offs and opportunity costs. I decided from the onset that for me to be a, success, a successful banker and distinguish myself, I need a higher degree. Achieving your goals in life requires sacrifice, requires commitment, requires perseverance and determination. I earned my master's degree from Obafemi Awolowo University in 1991. And I was primed at that time for the labor market. At this time, some of my peers already had jobs, while some were still job hunting. And by the way, if you look back at 1991, when I finished my master's, and comparing that era to this present day, not much has changed in terms of the outlook of the Nigerian economy. Employment opportunities were also scarce <laughs> at that time. So I don't want you to despair, OK? And in point of fact, if I, if I look back, some have even said 1991 was worse. Because at that time, Nigeria was under military rule. The country was like internationally alienated. And economic opportunities were scant in 91. The future at that time could be described as bleak. For nine months, I crisscrossed the entire Lagos, submitting my resume, scouting for job openings. And some of you will crisscross too, but don't give up. Nine months looking for a job. At that time, there was no job man. There was no online recruitment portals. You have to move from office to office, drop CVs, you know. There was no internet. In fact, there was internet very rarely in 1991. Access to that was difficult. There were no mobile phones or tablets. Only elites had landlines, if you can remember, and post office mailboxes, which were highly inefficient and grossly unavailable in 91. For months, nine months, seems to be, I did not receive a single invitation for a job interview. But I kept hope alive and prepared myself to take the opportunity when it finally comes. And eventually it came in September 91, when I was called for interview and subsequently I was employed as an entry-level staff at FBN Merchant Bankers. I took my chances. I left FBN in 97 and joined Zenit Bank, where I have been since then for one years and risen to become an executive director. The essence, <laughs> thank you. The essence of this narrative is simply to drive home the importance of vision and diligence. From the outset, I had a vision of my banking career, and I moved and I stayed with it. 
And we are familiar with the story of how eagles renew their strength. It's important to tell the story again, and I will crave your indulgence. The eagle has the longest lifespan of its species and can live up to 70 years. But to reach this age, the eagle has to take some tough decisions, make some hard choices, make some difficult choices. About its 35th to 40th year, its long and flexible talons can no longer grab the praise, which serves as food. Its long and sharp beak becomes bent. Its wings fall off. They're too thick. Then, the eagle is left with two options. Die or go through the painful process of change, which lasts about 150 days. What does the eagle do? The eagle will fly to a mountain top and sit on his nest. There, the eagle knocks its beak against the rock until it plucks it out. After plucking it out, the eagle will wait for a new beak to grow back. And then it will pluck out its talons. When its new talons grows back, the eagle starts to pluck out all the old aged feathers. Then after five months, the eagle takes its famous flight of rebirth and lives for up to another 30 years. Why is the story of the eagle's rebirth important? As you are released as eagles today into the real world, you will need to constantly renew your strength to survive and to thrive. Do not be stuck in the past because the world is rapidly changing. Expand your knowledge frontier. Study. Do not say there is no time. God told Joshua to study the book of the law. Meditate on it day and night so that you prosper and be successful. And I will leave you with the same advice. Study. Continue to read. Reinvent yourselves. Renew your strengths and thrive in a dynamic world. The transformation the world is undergoing promises to be unlike anything humankind has ever experienced. In fact, the transformation that we've seen in the last 30 years was not seen in the last 200 years in the world. Technological disruption is upending almost every industry in all countries transforming entire systems of production, management, governance, and learning. While we cannot fully discern the full ramifications of tech disruption at this nascent stage, you have received education for the future without any clue or idea of what the future will look like. This is the challenge that we must face. Notwithstanding all the challenges the world is grappling with presently, I want you to know that you are stepping into the best time in the human history. Today, our civilization is at crossroads, having reached a unique moment in history. We are at the cusp of major shifts that are altering and redefining the way we live and learn, the way we work the way we relate with one another, the changes we are experiencing are of monumental proportions and are driven by technological disruptions, especially the convergence of the physical environment and the digital space. We are now in the era of connectivity, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, robotics, cloud computing, which are combining to enable the internet of things. The new age we are living in is typified by the speed of technological breakthroughs, the pervasiveness of scope, and the tremendous impact of all new systems. This is the era of the fourth industrial revolution, aptly described by Professor Klaus Schwab, that's the founder and the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. This is the world you are stepping in. 
and the world you be living in. You are expected to be active participants in the disruption process and reap the benefits. You are not expected to end up as mere consumers or spectators. Whole new industries are emerging to offer products and services that will increase human efficiency, embrace human well-being. In this emerging new order, the opportunities are limitless. Enormous wealth will be created for those who ride the new waves. I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that Covenant University has prepared you adequately to thrive. As you step out today, imbibe the attributes of the eagle. Eagles have vision. Have a clear vision and be focused on your vision. Eagle, eagles embrace the storm. You will go through storms, embrace challenges, but they are necessary to lift you to greater heights. Eagles flock together. Choose your company carefully. Eagles, they renew their strength. Constantly reinvent yourself to be relevant. Eagles fly at high altitudes. Aim for the top. Do not settle for the little things. Spread your wings and soar like the eagles that you are. Congratulations and God bless you. Thank you very much. Please let's keep putting our hands together for the convocation lecturer. Are we tired of clapping? Please let's put our hands together. Thank you very much. You may please be seated. In my humble opinion, I would say that uh, this lecture has not only added to the long list of lectures on Covenant University by number, but it has added in substance and in quality. If you agree with me, can you please put your hands together again? At this moment, it is my privilege to invite the Vice Chancellor for his remarks. The Vice Chancellor, sir. Please let's put our hands together for Professor A.A.A. Atairo. You will agree with me that we have just been treated to a sumptuous intellectual meal. If you agree with me, please another round of applause for the lecturer. I bring you greetings from the Chancellor and Chairman Board of Regents, Covenant University, Dr. David Oyedepo, who is unavoidably absent today. He was with us yesterday, actually, in two different sessions yesterday, in the morning session and in the evening session. He brings his greetings to everybody here present today, the members of the Board of Regents, the faculty and staff of Covenant University, and most especially, the kings and queens in Hebron, the regal said. Without belaboring the lecture of today, I cannot but mention some things from the lecture, especially the way the lecturer concluded, which I totally agree with. He said, you have received education for the future without any clue or idea what the future will look like. That's a big challenge. It is not as big a challenge for you as students as it is for us as educators. How do we teach you? How do we educate you for a future? Nobody can say definitively that this is what the future will be like. But we try our best in fulfilling that onerous task. And how do we go about doing it? We believe that the best thing we can do for you as educators, like I said in the opening remark, is not to teach you per se, but teach you how to learn and how to relearn. A lot of things were said, I will just touch uh, on some of them. 
there is this general conception about uh, job loss because of automation. But how true is this? Is it a myth or is it a reality? If it is a reality, then we have a very big task on our hands. And the task is very simple, though big. We have to look for works that can be simplified into algorithms and turned into routines because those are the ones most amenable to automation and tell those who are in that line or in that field to start retraining and retraining fast. Because before you know it, your job will be taken over by the computers. But there are some other things that the com uh, computer is not good at, like the lecturer rightly noted. They are not too smart in thinking. They do iterations very fast and very easily. So what is the mission of the educator for the future? Is to teach our students the soft skills that the computer cannot take over from them. If we can do this successfully, then we can be sure that the future will be a very good one. The lecturer mentioned another thing. He said, think outside the box. Think outside the box. Or even better still, think as if there is no box. So in that wise, you will be doing yourself a world of good if you do not settle for tradition as we know it. I like using this analogy, and this talking about disruption, and I use the analogy of a very dynamic young man by the name of Elon Musk. Elon Musk told NASA that it is possible to have reusable rockets. He was almost laughed to scorn. He succeeded after the fourth trial. Now, SpaceX, we all know, is a reality. And NASA is giving jobs to Elon Musk. That's one person against an institution. We should be very careful when we're talking about experience, especially where we are today. This is the analogy. What is the use of experience in internal combustion engines of 50 years if what I'm building is an electric car. I say I'm a professor of internal combustion engines, so all I have to do is listen to the car, then I will tell you what to do in five, 10 seconds. Change the belt, change the valve, change the plug, do this, do that. But I come with my Tesla car, and you come to my car without prompting, and you put your head to it, and you hear nothing. So you say, put on the ignition, and I tell you it's on. Then you say, okay, then your car is dead. That's what you will assume. So you open the hood. And what do you see under the hood? Nothing. It's a storage space. So we have to be very, very careful about experience and tradition in this new ecosystem we are in. I was discussing with the Registrar of Covenant University not too long ago, what is the use of trying to bring somebody to the employ of Covenant University for the long run when, can, when I can break the work that person is supposed to do into chunks and outsource it on hop work? And you don't have to actually think about the bottom line in that wise. A lot of things are changing, the disruption is everywhere, but the good news we have is that the Nigerian university system is under a new lease with uh, the current leadership of the Nigerian uh, National Universities Commission under Professor Rashid. I was recently at Abuja where the vice chancellors of universities are thinking, how do we move away from the curriculum as we have it today? How do we give some flexibility to the curriculum? How can we have a Caleb University, a Covenant University, a Christland University, be a Caleb indeed, a Covenant indeed, a Christland indeed, and not just a committee of CUs. The only way we can do that is if we allow more flexibility into the curriculum development and each university cannot bring out its own ingenuity 
and identity. I believe that is going to happen very soon. I believe we have been treated to a very, very interesting lecture. For the parents here, I bring you again the goodwill from the Chancellor. Your labor of love and your partnership with us is much appreciated. And as we release your students tomorrow as eagles, they will bring joy to you in Jesus' mighty name. To the faculty, staff of Covenant University, can you please stand up if you're here in any guise for recognition? The faculty and the staff of Covenant University. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the people who have agreed to partner with God in fulfilling the vision of the university. You are most appreciated. Please, you may be seated. I was interviewed recently, and the interviewer was asking, how do you get to do these things you do in Covenant University? I said, it's, it's God. It is just God. But God used people. We have a very dynamic board of regents in Covenant University, seated right here in the front at this row. You are most appreciated, sir, sir, Max. It is on this note, I say, thank you, and thank you for coming for this event. And as you go back, may the Lord bless your part in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you. Can we please put our hands together again for Professor A.A.A. Atayero. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gotten to a point in the program where I'll recognize some distinguished personalities that have made time to come and attend our program today. With deep appreciation, we acknowledge the presence of the special guests that are here. We have in our midst the acting registrar of Angkor University, Abimbola Hulushesi. Please, let's put our hands together. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. We have the pro-chancellor of Ikiti State University, San Dele Hadishino. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. We have the principal of Faith Academy, Kinan Land, Patrick Kuo. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We're privileged to have in our midst today members of the Covenant University Board of Regents. And we have the secretary right here present, Pastor Chirma Okoye. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much for being here. We have Pastor Peter Ogbonyi. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. We have Pastor Isaac Folaji. Thank you very much for coming. We have Professor M Mrs. Irene Ogunloe. Thank you very much. We have Pastor Nathan Hiko. Thank you very much. We have here other executive and staff or executive staff of Zenith Bank. Thank you very much for coming. You're deeply appreciated. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to say that the wife of distinguished and erudite lecturers on the high table, distinguished colleagues, the egos of today. If anybody says that this university is less than 20 years old, with this world recognition and the level it is today, and how it has virtually conquered the educational world in Nigeria, they won't believe. But to those who are called by his name, we know that what we see is what we get, and what we believe is what we become. I was privileged to be a member of the Board of Regents for about eight years, beginning from 2002, when this university started. And the Roku tree that is erupting from that small seed of 2002 will still grow higher and higher. The lecture of today has been aptly described by the Vice Chancellor. I wish to adopt what he said with gratitude. It was thought-provoking, well-written, and excellently presented. I was particularly happy when he also highlighted the limitations of technology. And I said to myself, if it lacks creativity, it lacks intuition, and it lacks imagination, then the role of God for man remains 
And so man becomes inevitable in the affairs of life. <laughs> to the eagles of today, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. You have got not just education, but a very quality education at Covenant University. I recognize that defeating the problem is key, not defeating ourselves. One of the greatest challenges that we have in this country is we either technically avoid our problems thinking that they will solve themselves, or we try to defeat ourselves instead of defeating the problem. Now I charge you, as great egos that are going to the world, take on the challenge to use technology to defeat our problems rather than defeating ourselves in Nigeria. Let me conclude with the words of Barack Obama a few days ago in South Africa to the youth. He said, keep believing, keep marching, and keep building. He said, keep raising your voice. Every generation has the opportunity to remake the world. And you have that opportunity, not only to remake Nigeria, but to remake the world. In addition to the great words of exhortation and inspiration by the guest lecturer and our vice chancellor, please permit me to say to you all that failure is no option for you. And you will not fail in the precious name of Jesus Christ. If you try and fail, please try over and over and over again. Failure can never, ever dismantle the, the flag of success once determination exists. I wish you success in life. May God continue to increase Covenant University from glory to glory. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Please, can we put our hands together? Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to invite the acting registrar of Angkor University to please come for for his goodwill message. Please, let's put our hands together. You're welcome, sir. The Board of Regents, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tayeru, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, and all other members of management, and of course the lecturers of Anchor University, I'm sorry, <laughs> of Covenant University, the eagles who are set to fly, you will surely fly. On behalf of my Vice Chancellor and um, the management of Anchor University, it's my pleasure to Rejoice, because we are rejoicing, with Covenant University on the 13th Convocation Ceremonies, which started yesterday, and the sending off of um, the Rugal set. Um, permit me to say that I'm also rejoicing because my nephew is part of those who, are, who is um, convoking tomorrow. He studied computer science, so some of you will know him. Let me not mention his name. I also want to say that seated on the high table are two who we finished from the same secondary school. I attended Federal Government College, Wari. And I'm sure you know my father, Mr. Odulesi Josiah, the killer. You will remember. I also attended Federal Government College, Odugolu, where your register finished from. So I can say in a way, I'm part of the family. I want to thank the guest lecturer because he delivered a succinct lecture that actually tells what is on 
what really is the issue of the day, the disruption of technology. It's everywhere. And we just must key in into it. Many years ago, the principal of King's College, he said, if you are not online with technology, you'll be like an expired drug on the shelf. But I want to rejoice that today, we've gotten all that we need for us to soar. The eagles who are going for tomorrow, you will soar, you will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate you for your comment. Right away, I'd like to invite um, the Deputy Vice Chancellor for the vote of thanks. Professor Shalom Chinedu, you're welcome, sir. The Chancellor, Covenant University, Permit me to stand on the already established protocol as I present the vote of thanks for this event. We want to thank God who has made today possible. The Bible says, who is he that says that they come to pass when God has not commanded it? He is the owner of this university and we give God all the glory. We want to specially thank God for our Chancellor, Dr. David Oyedepo, for the visionary leadership, personal commitment to the Covenant University project. We give God thanks for his life and what God is doing through him is the visioner and committed in the running of the university. We also want to deeply appreciate all the members of the Board of Regents of Covenant University here present. We thank you for honoring this invitation with your presence this morning. Of course, today has been a great day. The 13th Convocation Lecture of Covenant University. I want to specially thank the Convocation Lecturer of today Sir, it has been a very, very inspiring lecture, insightful, and very, very impactful. Thank you for the delivery. Again, we want to thank all the covenant parents and guardians here present today. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you also for allowing your words to pass through this crucible of Covenant University. We are glad that they are being returned to you today as eagles set to soar. We want to thank all the friends and associates of this great university. We thank every one of you that is here present this morning to be part of this great event. We also want to thank the kingmakers, the faculty and staff of Covenant University, particularly the members of Senate here present this morning. Thank you for the great job, for the good job that God is using you to do in Covenant University. We want to again recognize the regular set the 2018 graduating set of Covenant University, the kings and queens in Hebron. This is your day, and we congratulate every one of you for making it at last. Finally, we want to thank the members of the press that are here this morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. We say thank you very much for honoring us with your presence on this very occasion. May the Lord bless you richly. And as you go back, let the same grace that brought you here this morning take you back safely to your different de dest destinations. Thank you very much and be blessed in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. 
the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Covenant University, Professor Shalom Chinedu. Please let's put our hands together for him again. I'd like to invite right away for the announcement of today's program the Chair, CPC, Dr. Babajide. Please let's put our hands together for her as she comes for the announcement. And everything that has a beginning definitely must have an end. And since we started this program with God, we will be ending with God because he is the alpha and the omega of everything. Respectfully, please put your hands together as I invite the secretary of the Covenant University Board of Regent, Pastor Shirma Okwai, to please come and give the closing prayer. Please let's put our hands together. Praise the Lord. Shall we be upstanding? Please lift your voices and let's give glory to God for a wonderful event of this nature. Give him glory, give him praise. Magnify his holy names. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He began and is ending with us. Magnify his holy name. In Jesus' mighty name. Our Father and our God, who have returned with a heart of gratitude, a deep sense of appreciation to you and to you alone, who has been all in all to this university. Every stride we have made, you are the one that made it. To you alone will turn all the glory in the name of Jesus. As we continue in this 13th convocation, let your presence be mighty. 
let your presence be mighty. As we release these eagles, their wings shall not be broken. They shall soar high and high. In the name of Jesus, for everyone that is rejoicing with us, you shall rejoice forever. You will have, never have occasion to mourn. In the name of Jesus, for any and every contribution you have made, the Lord will reward you. In Jesus' mighty name, shall we share in God's goodness? Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. It is my new done era. What eyes have not seen or ears heard shall become the other day in my life this year. Congratulations. God bless you. Please, while we remain standing, we will be taking the Covenant University anthem. The band, please. the band will continue to play as we have the procession. The Vice Chancellor, leave the all, please. The band. And the members of the Covenant University Senate will be joining in the procession. of our guest lecturer and members of the Zenith Bank will be exiting the hall too.
Ola Dikwa Ukikiolua, Banking and Finance. Please see me at the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a blessed day.